So, the 1991 Formula 1 season, it was a season where the great Ayrton Senna would win his third world championship with McLaren, a star was born in the name of Michael Schumacher, and the sport would say goodbye to one of its most prestigious and loved teams in Coloni Racing. Coloni were a team like no other, starting an incredible 14 Grand Prix out of 82, and scoring some fantastic results as well, like, um, uh, like, ah. Uh, Ah, uh, maybe not. So, Coloni didn't really make the mark they intended to in Formula 1, but there's no way they could go lower than that, right? Surely not. In September 1991, Coloni was saved by Italian Andrea Sassetti. Now, who was this guy? That's a very good question. Zazetti was a fashion designer for women's shoes. Think Alpha Tauri, just a little bit more shit. Now, you'd think to make your mark in Formula 1, you'd maybe want to snipe some of the top engineers off the grid. Maybe from a Williams, or a Ferrari, or a McLaren. Well, Zazetti thought otherwise, and decided that some of his workers through one of his shoe factories would make perfect Formula 1 engineers. <laughs> like, we've just started and you already can't make this up, can you? The team would be named Andrea Modra and start with an all-Italian driver lineup, acquiring the services of veteran backmarker driver Alex Caffey and Coloni's 1989 driver Enrico Battaglia. However, this lineup would last about as long as we thought Rich Energy were a credible company. Suzetti and Andrea Modra would arrive to the first race of the 1992 season with a modified Coloni car but they'd be barred from competing by the FIA. At the time, there was a rule where all new teams had to pay a $100,000 deposit in order to begin racing. Cezzetti, being the F1 god that he is, thought, yeah, I, I won't need to pay that, and so just rocked up to the first race and expected to compete. Cezzetti had argued that the team was still the Coloni outfit for the previous year, Though the FIA didn't buy that and told him to piss off and come back with $100,000. This ineptitude on a team management front obviously frustrated both drivers, Caffey and Batasia, leading them to criticise the running of the team. Sazetti responded to this by calling both drivers into a room and telling them to get fucked. Now, without drivers, Sazetti went about finding two more. He eventually went with another ex Coloni racer in Roberto Moreno and rookie Perry McCarty. When the team arrived in Brazil for round two of the season, their cars weren't even finished yet but that wouldn't matter anyway. In yet another case of the team being underprepared, Moreno would fail to qualify and McCarthy would be barred from entering due to not even having a super license to be able to race. McCarthy would later acquire this super license but both cars would still fail to qualify for the next two rounds in Spain and San Marino. Now, around this time one of Andrea Mo's original drivers, Enrico Battaglia, came back with about one million dollars from sponsorship money. Cezzetti, being the money-loving businessman that he was, was very willing to forget the Fairs feud in the past and set about replacing McCarthy with Batasia. However, the FIA would block this move, deeming Cezzetti to be making too many changes to their driver lineup in too short a space of time. This would naturally enrage Cezzetti, but who would he hold to blame for all this, you ask? Maybe the FIA or F1? No, he blamed Perry McCarthy. I'm sorry, what the fuck? For the rest of the season, Cezzetti treated McCarthy in a way that would make Red Bull's treatment of Daniel Kvyat look like them bowing down to the Messiah. But we'll get onto that a little bit later. The team would rock up to Monaco, but in an incredible turn of events, Moreno would actually qualify for the race. What? Could this be the turning point of Andre Moda's season? Could Moreno finish? Could he even score points? Well, no. Moreno's engine, so shocked to have the opportunity of taking part in a race, decided to blow up just 11 laps into the Grand Prix. But incredibly, Andrea Moreno's only race appearance wasn't the main story surrounding the team that weekend. That lied with McCarthy's car. In pre-qualifying, to say McCarthy's time was slightly off the pace would be, well, a bit of an understatement. Michelle Alboreto would lead the pre-qualifying timesheets with a 1.25.413. McCarthy set the official lap time 15 and a half minutes slower. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. At the Canadian round, the team showed up, but very quickly there was a problem. They didn't even have an engine. Our main man, Suzetti, had failed to play engine supply Judd, but luckily we were able to borrow an engine from Brabham. Yet, despite all this, the team was still woefully slow when both cars failed to qualify for the race once again. By this point, all of Andrea Moda's sponsors had decided to pull out, and to be honest, who could blame them? This left Suzetti to fund the team on his own, and well, you can guess how well this is going to go, can't you? McCarthy's crappy treatment would continue into the British Grand Prix, where on a perfectly dry track, Suzetti thought it'd be funny to send his driver out on full wet tyres. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. <laughs> 
Come on. And if he didn't think Zazetti's treatment of McCarthy could get any worse, in Hungary he'd block his driver from leaving the pits until there's just 45 seconds left in the session. And even nowadays, cars wouldn't be able to get around the track in that time. Like... Come on, this is childish now. Things would get serious in Belgium, however. Sazetti noticed there was a broken steering component in Moreno's car, so thought to himself, hmm, I wonder who likes broken steering? Oh, I know. However, after swapping parts on Moreno and McCarthy's car, McCarthy would suffer an incredibly scary accident at the top of Radion, which could honestly have cost him his life. Yeah, this isn't funny anymore. At this point, the FIA had had enough, wanting to expel Sazetti and his team from the championship, However, Sazetti was nowhere to be found in the paddock. Why, you ask? Well, by this point, Sazetti had been arrested for allegedly forging invoices for car parts. Like, I know, this just couldn't get any worse, could it? Well, turns out, yeah, yeah, it can. Sazetti's money used to buy the Formula 1 team in the first place was obviously called into question. And even nowadays, we don't really know where it all came from. At one point, there were even links to the Mafia. And there's even a documented case of a gunman shooting at Sazetti after one of his nightclubs mysteriously caught fire. Huh. The real source of money is likely to remain a mystery, but Andre Moto would show up to the next race in Monza, only to be told to go and do one by the FIA. They would not return for the 1993 F1 season, and the name later was used as one of Euro Motorsport sponsors in kart that year. Perry McCarthy would never race in Formula 1 and was deemed the unluckiest racing driver of all time, but he would end up finding fame portraying the Stig on Top Gear, so there's that. So, were Andre Moda one of the worst F1 teams of all time? Well, they're certainly up there, and in fact, to call them an F1 team at this point, it's practically an insult to the sport as a whole. They were woefully slow and ran by a potato who let his childish morals rule his head and that could have led to some really serious repercussions in Belgium 1992. But yeah, if you did enjoy the video, make sure you do leave a like, comment and of course subscribe. Let me know what other drivers and teams you want me to cover in this series and what you thought of Andrew Moda. Do you think they really were the worst F1 team of all time? With all that said and done though, I hope you had a lovely rest of your week and I will see you in the next one.